Speedy? Speedy, Speedy. The love hour, Kevin, is not here. <laughs> but also, he's here. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Love Hour. I am your host, Miss Kev, on stage, and I am not joined by my co-host, Kevin Fredericks. He has most of the month off this month because I am soft launching my four women only series where I will bring on guests of different genres, walks of life, all of those things and talk about issues that are specifically targeted to women. And my first guest is Dr. Kiara King. I'm so Kiara. Kiara. Oh, I said it right the first yes, time. Yes, you did. Kiara King. Um, I'm so excited. She is a licensed practicing medical OBGYN. Uh, please tell the people a little bit about yourself. I am Dr. Kiara King. I'm a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist um, practicing in the Chicago area. And um, I have a huge passion for um, women's health, obviously, and helping women to advocate for themselves, um, helping to educate and empower women to know more about their bodies. And so I am thrilled to be here today. Me too. I am so um just super super excited actually for the like this whole series but more um talking about like women's health issues and i'll tell you kind of what spawned this we're skipping the that or this this or that question if you haven't noticed we're just gonna dive right in because we got a lot to talk about <laughs> um but one of the things that um spawned this for me and actually a lot of the topics that happen on the podcast actually are things that happen in my real real life and i'd be like you know what if these are questions for me if i'm going through this i'm sure there are other women that absolutely. have the same questions absolutely so First, I have talked a lot on the podcast about um, I started looking. We do a lot of traveling. We do a lot mm -hmm. of speaking engagements. We just be doing a heck of a whole lot. And um, feminine products such as pads and tampons aren't the best. Um, and I'm always concerned about toxic, so toxic shock syndrome and just a lot of different things. So I started looking into alternative mm -hmm. options, yep. um, namely menstrual cups. Mm -hmm. And when I first started using them, I realized first how uncomfortable I was touching my own body. Got it. And B, it's like you need to insert it and tuck it behind your cervix. Uh -huh. And I was like, well, what? where is that? At? <laughs> but you're not alone because there are I see women all the time and they'll be either asking about tampon use or um, the vaginal ring uh, for mm. birth control and they'll say, I don't want to put anything down there. And I'm like, it's your body. Like right. you touch your arm, you touch your hair, you touch your feet. It's it's another body part. But I think we have stigmatized 100 percent any male or female reproductive organs, but they are, they're part of your body. Mm -hmm. So there's no, nothing wrong with you getting to know your body, especially if you're inserting something for feminine hygiene or for birth control, there's nothing wrong with it, but you're not alone. I have women that look at me like I have two heads when I say, oh, you just have to put it in the vagina. And they're like, girl, I'm what? I'm not putting that there down there and I'm like it's not down there it's your body <laughs> you know I think that pulling um identifying this that there is a stigma mm -hmm. attached to like our reproductive organs our body parts um and then work consciously and intentionally working on reversing that in our own minds yes. is so important yes. and that's part of the reason I um even I brought on sex positive families I don't know if you um know her but she has a post on or I mean a page on Instagram and she basically talks about like teaching our children about our body parts Absolutely. in the same way you're just like you touch your arm and your hair yep. like it's the same for a lot of people it's not the yep. same and so being able to um, work on yourself to recognize it's just it's your body and not just that this was my other like real life revelation I've had two kids both by c-section mm -hmm. um, I have a husband and I'm like listen some of a whole lot of people I get feminine hygiene done grooming done some of a whole bunch of people have touched and seen <laughs> what meanwhile I, what i haven't seen and touched that's a problem yeah. when i like sat down and really thought right. about it that's i was true. like this is a problem the nerve to just be like everybody Willy else nilly. <laughs> it's true but i have a four-year-old daughter uh -huh. and since we could 
talk and we'd be in the bath, I'd say, this is your vulva. Like we weren't having these conversations like your pocketbook, your coin purse, all these other misnomers. I've never heard of and coin purse. You know, people come up with, with all the, kinds of stuff. Any and everything to not I mean, say. That could have been a question. What, what names do you have? Do people have for their vulva vagina? And that's another thing that people often say my vagina when they really mean like their external genitalia yes. which is like the vulva yes. so people be like my vagina hurts Shall we like, just learned this on the podcast I'm like, that is not your vagina your vagina is the internal organ not the external the external has its own names so but I think I think it's super important um, and I think if you are bringing that information up to little ones when they're little. Just as you, you know, how often do you say, where's your nose? Mm -hmm. Where's your ears? And mm -hmm. not that you're gonna just be asking them randomly, where's their vulva or right. vagina? <laughs> but if you do it in such a way, you take away that stigma. You yes. take away like, that it's something to giggle about, that it's something to be ashamed about. Um, because it's not, it's just, it's just our body. So. That was so great. And I think that is a great segue. We're going to start and kick off this conversation. Uh, we're going to be talking about myth busters or dispelling myth busters, I should say. Dispelling myths is what I want to say. Um, but before we do that, we're going to do a little, not we tell you, Dr. King <laughs> is going to do a little like anatomy 101 drawing. Okay. So that way we're all on the same page as to what our... Um, body looks like. Yes. Okay, here we go. So for those in the medical community, I am not netter. That's like our, our like book when we, in like in medical school with these beautiful anatomical okay. drawings. That's not me. This is just going to be super basic. So, and I'm kind of drawing backwards. I'm going to turn this around a little bit. I'll start with like the internal anatomy. Um, I have women all the time that will ask me what's inside or like, I think my tubes or ovaries are hurting. And it's like, well, your tubes and ovaries aren't up here. So let's really figure out what's going on. I'm serious. What is <laughs> funny is that I can just imagine my doctor and the conversations that they have after they leave. Like even just talking about me, like, girl, this woman came in here. <laughs> Talking to this nonsense, and she don't even know. Like, I just think and, that's funny. And I honestly, I try and just really educate people because if the thing is, if they never learn, yes. how would like how would you know? Like, mm -hmm. I went to medical school for a zillion years, and okay, not a zillion, <laughs> but um, you know, to learn all of this stuff. So that's why I just try and educate at visits. Even like I said, it could be very basic, but I think it goes a, a long way. So starting out with like internal anatomy, we have the uterus. I'm actually gonna draw it this way and okay. then turn it around. Y'all don't laugh at my drawing. Um, kind of looks like maybe like an upside down pear. Um, and you have fallopian tubes that come off the side and they have kind of like little finger proje projections. And then your ovaries are off to the side here. Okay. So, um, and your cervix is actually part of your uterus. It's just like the lower edge. I usually, when I describe it to patients, if I don't happen to have pen and paper, I tell people to think of it like a balloon that's blown up. Mm. And the neck of the balloon is like your cervix. And the balloon part that's blown up is your uterus, like where a baby would be. So when, um, like, so there's like a cervical canal and then inside. And quite honestly, I'm just drawing this for um, the purpose of, being clear but so when like when a woman has a period for example the lining of the uterus like all this stuff here is what sheds okay. and comes out of the cervix okay gotcha got it so i learned i have a question for uh -huh. you while we're here i um again going back to my menstrual cup situation i was like i uh -huh, know uh -huh, it's in the menstrual uh, the <laughs> cervix and they i read somewhere that the cervix feels, feels like, like the edge of, that's yeah, true like the tip of the okay nose. tell us i mean it it just it's it's Kind of firm and fleshy. Yeah, so, I imagine I an know. orange actually. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not that. It's not, not hard, that hard like that. No, okay. not not generally. If it's hard, maybe something else is going on. But um, it's generally kind of firm and um, like a little, like a little, like soft. Like you can definitely like feel I it. felt like it's like my and I agree with you because I was like it. I was looking for something that's more squishy, which uh -huh. is why I thought orange. It's like firmer than an orange, but it still has give. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Absolutely. And so. Like for your menstrual cup, cup situation, basically the cup, let me move that arrow. Well, I guess it kind of still works because that's where blood is coming out. But the cup basically comes and then sits around the cervix. And so that's why it's important to know where your cervix is because if you just have it randomly in the vagina, it's, we're gonna have a problem. It don't work, y'all. It don't work, we're gonna have <laughs> accidents. All type of problems. 
that's all not gonna of look, the that's problems. not gonna look good. But yeah, some people don't even like don't even realize this is what happens. And then I'm saying, okay, you ovulate an egg and then it travels down the fallopian tube. And then potentially if you're trying to get pregnant, it meets some sperm in the fallopian tube and then a little baby is formed and then it come back comes back and implants in the uterus. So a lot, but sometimes people, like, they don't realize that. Yes, like, they have that was no good. idea. Tell us where in our body this situation is. So this whole situation is, like, here, like, down in your pelvis. So this would be, like, way down here, if I were to say Is it up. really? Yes. That's what I'm telling you. People are like, my ovaries hurt. And I'm like, your ovaries are not up there. They're not over here. They're not back here. Yeah. Serena, <laughs> you knew that? You knew it was that low? It's, I don't I mean, think it's, it's I realize. Low. If you feel like your hip bones, okay. you feel your pelvic Let's bones do it on together. the side, right? Yep. So your uterus is generally much lower than that in your pelvis. Um, when a woman is pregnant, as um, usually around like maybe 12, 13 weeks, then that uterus starts to rise up out of the pelvic bones. But it's for the most part kind of protected in the in, inside the pelvic bones. So it's pretty deep in the pelvis. It is not. I mean, unless someone has really large fibroids or something, it's not like up here. Oh, no. that was good. It's down deep. I mean, you, cramps, you can have like referred pain and other things going on in your abdomen. But yeah, everything is pretty low. Again, uh, unless you have your uterus is enlarged for some reason, it's pretty low. Oh, so after all of that, child, I need a glass of wine, <laughs> which is why I want to tell you about First Leaf. They are one of our sponsors for the podcast. They offer award-winning wine that you are guaranteed to love. Um, you can get started with First Leaf, First Leaf by taking a wine quiz to assess your exact wine drinking prefer preferences. From sweetness to wine styles to even how adventurous you are, we learned all about it and so can you. As you all know, Kevin and I started off drinking the Moscato like sweet wines, but recently, child, Joshua got me talking about some some cabs that's what you like right i'm saying it right what the wine quiz does is it allows you to test and decide um, how adventurous you want to be if you want something sweet if you want something floral if you want something bold um whether you're a newbie to wine drinking beginner intermediate expert uh you wines that you've already had that you know you don't like they will disqualify for you wines that you've had that you like they will like intensify or at least find like the common thread of what you like and then offer suggestions to you based off what you like. I love this because it allows you to explore your palate without taking a, whole, a heck of a whole lot of risk. Because listen, child, wine can be expensive. And so you want to get something that you're going to like. Um, so when our first bottles arrived, we tasted and rated them online. First Leaf took my ratings and selected unique wines based on my test, my taste for my next shipment. So everything becomes customized to you. What you need to do right now, if you're interested, it's child, it's about to be fall. Oh, it's a good time to sit by the fireplace with a good glass of wine and just relax because that's all we need to do. Um, you're going to sign up with the link and you'll get exclusive intro offer. Six bottles of wine for only $29.95 plus free shipping. Just go to tryfirstleaf.com slash love. That's six bottles of wine for only $29.95. First of all, you can't halfway fill up your gas tank for $29.95. These are facts. So to get six bottles of wine for twenty nine ninety five plus free shipping, don't at me. Just buy the stuff. Uh, what you're going to do is go to tryfirstleaf.com slash love. First of all, after we've had our sip of wine, we've <laughs> learned our anatomy. Do you need to add anything else here? So this is like pretty much internal. Got the internal. Okay. I'm going to erase this. Okay. And do a little, little external drawing. Um, cause I think this is really critical. Um, and there are essentially three orifices mm. in the, in the women's, in a woman's external anatomy. Three. Three. Okay. Tell me. Okay. I feel like I know two. Okay. <laughs> Here, I'm going to draw this this way. Y'all do not laugh. At There's my, no judgment. Do not laugh at my, my drawing skills. It is, it may be a little like not to scale, but you'll, you'll get the point. Um, Oh, we're like this. Yes, okay. we're like this. Okay. This is called lithotomy position. Okay. That's the, that's the name of it. Um, so we have, I'm just going to erase that for the sake of that. Okay. I told y'all do not make fun of my drawing. So this is if a woman, like if you're getting a pap smear, uh -huh. this is kind of how it looks to your gynecologist. Like this is how your anatomy looks. So we have. This the, is so great. We have the anus, which is where 
poop comes out. We have the vagina, which is actually not a just a random hole here. It doesn't just look like a wide open hole like that. And then we have the urethra, which is where urine comes out. Mm. So, you know, a lot of women don't realize that like urine and like menstrual blood don't come out of the same Mm -hmm. space. They think it's all one. I think I most certainly thought that magical opening. not too far yes. past. You're like, just recently, just <laughs> yes. yesterday. Yeah. Right now, um, five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I learned it at right now o'clock. So, yeah, so there are three different openings. And so the vagina... Can I pause you really absolutely. quickly? So she said three, right? And I was like, oh, I think I know two. I knew none. Oh, <laughs> oh no, I knew one. You knew, okay, you knew vagina. vagina. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I definitely thought vagina and vulva were going to be separate. No, but yeah. so the vulva, so the vulva, that's a really good point. The vulva is the labia. Mm-hmm. You guys have heard that term. The lips. The, the lips, yep. And then like what we call the mons pubis. I just learned that too. Yeah. Tell the people what it is. So the mons pubis is basically um, almost essentially like the hair bearing region on mm. the external genitalia. That, I mean, that's the easiest way to think of where yeah, it I is. Yeah, I like that. That's pretty much where it is. Um, like kind of right below like your bikini line. Yep. So um, that essentially all comprises the vulva. And that's all external. Okay. So I see a lot of women who will say, well, my vagina. And then what they really mean when I go to do an exam because they're concerned about something, they really are describing their vulva. So they're separate. So ladies, let's make that differentiation so we're not talking about vaginas when we're really talking about vulvas because they're totally Boom. different. Education. They're different. Um, and then another thing that's important to know is, again, the vagina is not just like a whole, like a, a circle open hole. Like when we go to do a pelvic exam, um, it's really more of a potential space, meaning I have to insert a speculum to be able to see the cervix. I can't just look externally and just see into the soul of the, of the vagina. Like you have to be able to put in some, uh, put in a speculum and be able to be able to see further in. So when, when you say potential space, because I actually like low key I'm getting like a whole word but from that I really am but I want to know like what in the medical world what does that mean it just means it can expand and and conform based on what's inserted absolutely okay yep that's exactly what it is so unless there is someone something occupying the space it it's usually collapsed or flattened so the vagina again if it's not just a circular open open orifice that you can see into it's it's not until you put something into it that it expands around whatever you put have put in got it i love that Think of like a tampon space. or something yes. like that a menstrual cup and that's why you have to collapse your menstrual it, cup down to, to ins- insert it because it's not like you can just it's not like a you know those games kids play like it's like a square and like a peg yeah like uh-huh. yeah you don't just like put the circle into the hole yes, like you have yes, to kind yes. of like ease it on in i got the space. you yep i love that so that that I feel like that was. I felt like it was good. Did you yeah. cover all your I points? Think I covered girl? all the points with the listen. With Dr. The little King anatomy took lesson us here to <laughs> medical school for dummies. I love it. I'm the dummies. Me. No, no, um, no. That was so freaking great. Thank you so much Absolutely. for taking the time for Absolutely. educating. I think it's so important me, though y'all. because it's, it's just it helps people know what's going on with their bodies and you have the language to use to be able to say this hurts versus yes. like it kind of just hurts down there and then. You're like, right here, no, 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 right here, no, no, no. You know, you can say, my labia hurts or like my vulva hurts or inside the vagina hurts, you know. I think that that's another really good segue into um, advocating for yourself. Mm -hmm. So something that's like really common and popular um, messaging that we get. And I mean, it's a fact about um, especially women of color um, not receiving or getting the proper care that they need. So teaching us to advocate for ourselves partly starts with knowledge absolutely so making sure that you're not just this is so funny I tell my kids um, when they were younger and they would just be crying and I would be like you have to use your words yes please tell me like you use one finger and show me where it hurts right and it's kind of like that same idea like I'm here I want to help you but if you can't tell me where it hurts yes so to speak yes it's hard for me to properly diagnose yep. you and so, even takes longer to get 
get and it to takes that point. longer. Yeah. So can you give us some um, tip? We can do this quick because I want I know I said myth busters and I want to make sure we get to it. Um, how can you model or give us examples of what advocating for ourselves in the doctor's office looks like? Those questions we should ask, like all of that kind of stuff. I'm trying not to be long winded and ask my clarifying questions. So I'm going to shut up and let you answer. Absolutely. So I, I think it's important to just start off with like, Really quickly, historically in medicine, um, it it tended to be a very paternalistic view, mm-hmm. um, and it was kind Explain of like what paternal. Oh, yep. Yep. So it was kind of like whatever the doctor said. Like no one was really asking follow up questions. It was I would say, Melissa, um, I'm going to do this test on you. We need to do this because I said so. And yes. you'd be like, okay, okay. And then you'd go home and tell your family. Well, the doctor said we had to do this test, and that's what we're going to do. And then that was it. And then you would do the test and they would tell you it was good or bad or what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, versus now, we've really gotten away from that in medicine so that patients um, are more autonomous. Yes. Um, and they have more um, say in their care. It's more of like we're walking through this together versus I'm just leading and you're following blindly behind mm-hmm. and hoping I'm taking you to a good destination. And so in terms of advocating for oneself, I think it's so important just to have some tools going in. That could be a matter of writing down a list of questions I think that's that so you can go in with. So if you're having a particular complaint or concern, writing down, is this normal? Um, should I be worried about this? What can this cause? You know, any questions you can think of. And, you know, write, everybody has smartphones and stuff nowadays. Write it in a list on your phone. Write it on a real piece of paper. And then bring that with you because that also helps you not to forget versus yes. just storing up like, okay, I have these 10 questions I want to ask. And then you get there and then you may feel overwhelmed. You might start talking about something else or something else comes up and then you've totally forgotten yes. what all of your questions um, were. Another big thing is if you feel comfortable, you know, depending on what you're going for, if you feel comfortable, bring someone with you mm. um, who, especially when people are getting diagnoses that are a lot more serious. Mm-hmm. If, for example, if, if we tell somebody that they have cancer, the majority of what they hear after that is just like in a fog. Yeah. They're, they hear you hear cancer and you stop listening. You, I mean, you start thinking like, what am I going to do for my children? Right. What, how is my family going to survive? I, all of those things Mm -hmm. Um, and having someone there with you can help buffer that and they can you know redirect and say okay well what do we need to do now versus you just sitting there in a state of shock so bringing someone with you um, I'm a huge advocate I talk to patients about this hopefully it doesn't happen too often but you can find a second opinion Mm -hmm. you know if if you feel that you're not getting the information you need if you feel that the that it's just not a good fit um, between you and the physician, it's okay to, to see someone thing. else. Yeah. Like it's, I tell people all the time, this is your body. You have to feel comfortable with the decisions that you have made with your body. Yes. Um, because you don't want to ever look back and regret, right. oh man, I should have seen somebody else. Maybe I would have found out why I had these symptoms a month ago or 10 months ago or two years ago mm-hmm. um, versus just going along just because you've been seeing that person forever. So, you know, there's so many things and just knowing that it's okay to ask. Yes. I've had patients say, I'm sorry, but I have a question. And I'm like, why are you apologizing? Right. This is why you're here. Mm-hmm. Um, and you want to be able to leave the doctor's office knowing that you've had questions answered. Now, depending on what you're coming, if you're coming for something very routine, your, your questions may be answered all in one visit. It may right. not be a really big deal. Mm-hmm. But if you're coming um, and there's a more serious ongoing issue, you know, you want to make sure that you're getting information during those visits that's helping you, not just going and listening to what needs to be done to you. Right. That was really good. I want to just recap your takeaways because I thought they were so good and they're worth recapping. Um, So number one, writing things down. Absolutely. I think that is so important. You don't know, even just recently, I went to the doctor and in my mind, I'm like, these are my symptoms, like on the day that I have the symptoms. This is what's going on. Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. And I go to the doctor and I 
totally forget. <laughs> so writing things down, writing down your questions, writing down your symptoms, mm-hmm. writing Absolutely. like I think that is so important. Um, number two, bringing someone with you, I also think is important because in the moment that you receive some diagnosis or anything in your mind, it goes off in la la land asking someone or bringing someone who will ask those questions in your mental absence yes is good. absolutely um and then what was the last thing you just said um oh you just said the last one that was good yes get a second opinion um also very good that is taking ownership yep and it's learning to um be empowered yes to take ownership over your body and your health absolutely so if you don't feel like the doctor which something was really good that you said if if a patient asks you um oh i'm so sorry but i have a question if you feel like your doctor's response isn't that's okay right. if you feel like you're a nuisance for asking those questions you are empowered to find another absolutely doctor. and i think honestly some people don't even realize that and you like I agree they don't have the capacity to like ask those questions like can I see someone else I've sometimes suggested it like Mm -hmm. listen why don't you like sometimes if you hear it more than once from one person you then you can say okay that person wasn't just telling me that Um, and if you go to another person and they review your records and they say oh well I think you have X and you're like oh that's what Dr. A Mm -hmm. said told me and Dr. B told me the same thing okay this is probably what's going on. And you then they can decide whether to go back to Dr. A or to stay with Dr. B right. or whatever they want to do, but they don't just feel stuck right. like in that they don't have the opportunity to make that decision. Oh my gosh, I think you have helped save souls because that is so, I think that is empowering information that you that we may assume that we know, but we don't really realize. Right. We have so much more control than we think we, we do. Yep, absolutely. That's so good. All right, let's get into our Mythbusters. Okay. All right, before we do, I want to tell y'all about the myth buster of time. <laughs> there is a finite amount of time in any day. It's just, these are just facts. We think we can do it all. The fact of the matter is we cannot. So anytime you can do something better, faster, cheaper, uh, more efficiently, do that, which is why I want to tell you about ShipStation. It is all of those things for my entrepreneurs out there that have merchandise that they want to ship, but they need more time back in their day so they can spend that time with their family. So they can f- spend that time with the husband. So they can spend that time doing a V date and learning that your fallopian tubes ain't up here. <laughs> Hello, somebody. All right. So let me tell you about ShipStation. We use ShipStation. As you know, we have a merch business. I should have wore a merch shirt um, where we ship stuff all the time out to you guys. And we use uh, ShipStation as a um, platform that integrates into our selling platform, which is Eventbrite. And they integrate into Eventbrite. They integrate into um, eBay, into um, Etsy, all of these different programs that you can use that you potentially could sell stuff that you have. Um, ShipStation helps you get orders out quick save money on shipping costs and keep your customers happy no matter whether you, where you're selling whether it's from Amazon Etsy or your own website ship stations brings all your orders into one simple interface right now our love our listeners get to try ship station for free 60 day for 60 days when you use offer code love that's l-o-v-e there's absolutely no risk and you can start your free trial without even entering your credit card just visit shipstation.com click on the microphone at the top of the home page and then type in love that's l-o-v-e again you're going to go to shipstation.com enter offer code love shipstation.com make ship happen all right now i want to tell you about the importance of a good night rest because after you get some time back in your day what you're going to want to do is be able to sleep peacefully calmly and through the night and part of the way to do that is to get sheets that are good and comfortable can i tell you how difficult it is to find good quality sheets i have tried um many a places I will not say them aloud. And I have thrown many a sheets away um, because finding good sheets is difficult. And it is important, just as important as um, finding a good mattress. You need to find sheets that are comfortable, sheets that are breathable, sheets that are made with fabric and material that you feel like you get in a good night's rest. And that is what Etitude offers. We got the black sheets. And when I tell you, they make you feel all luxurious and nice and fancy and 
Child, like you got your whole life together with an 850 credit score. That's what these sheets do. If you want to get the best sleep of your life, you've got to try Attitude Sheets. Attitude Sheets are so comfortable. That's true. They The organic clean bamboo is extremely breathable. It regulates your temperature to improve your quality of sleep. Why not try Attitude? That these amazing sheets have a 30 day risk free trial. Listen, we be all about the risk free trials over here on the Love Hour podcast. Um, if you're not satisfied, you return your sheets for a full refund they even cover shipping on returns attitude sheets they're soft as silk breathable as linen but at the price of cotton that's called balling on a budget you're going to love them when you support our sponsors you support the show and right now our listeners get 20 percent off their first sheet set and free shipping just text our that's h-o-u-r to 47 47 47 the only way to get 20 percent off your your attitude sheet and free shipping is to text the word our that's h-o-u-r to 47 47 47 again our to 47 47 47 message and data rates may apply all right you ready to talk about these myths yes child there was a whole lot of them all right, here we go. Myth buster. Uh, let's talk about yoni stones. Okay. What are they? What do they do? Are they good for you? Are they not? Is it a gimmick? All the things. All of the things. <laughs> so yoni stones have been used for thousands of years by a variety of cultures. And they are essentially like egg-shaped okay. stones. Um, a lot of times they're made out of jade mm-hmm. um, or some other like inert stone that you know won't cause any like infections or anything like that and people place them inside the vagina okay anatomy review inside the vagina Mm -hmm. not sitting outside on the vulva Mm -hmm. it's inside um and people say that they help with pelvic pain um uh pelvic floor muscular like exercises um a lot of people use them i don't think there's ever been any scientific studies per se on yoni eggs um, or yoni stones in terms of like what they do they're a pretty benign object in terms of like they're not going to really cause you have any infections or anything like that so I think if people want to use them they're fine I don't think they're going to necessarily cause any harm some people find that they have you know they're more centered Mm -hmm. Um, essentially when you place them inside your uh, pelvic floor musculature has to hold it inside so Mm -hmm. it doesn't like slide or come out um, and so some people feel more centered, feel more aware of their body, um, and that can be helpful. So I don't think there's anything wrong with them. If they, if someone chooses to use them and whatever, you know, benefits they ascribe, go for it. I love that. And so, and you also mentioned they could help with like Kegels or, um, that's all I got is Kegels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Kegels are exercises that are basically um, like, you know, like if we are lifting weights and like doing bicep curls. Kegels are ways to exercise the muscles in the pelvic floor. Um, that was such a great analogy because I imagined the muscle yes. doing that same thing. That was fantastic. You can literally like sit and do them. Yes. Have you ever done one yes, before? I, yes. Okay. We did them so, last week with Dr. Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> so you sit there and you can feel like the muscles contract. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for, for some people, they can be beneficial to kind of help identify like where to contract. Mm. Um, because Otherwise, you may not really feel like, am I squeezing my abdominal muscles? Right. Am I squeezing like the muscles near the vagina? Like, what am I supposed to be contracting? So for some people, that helps. A lot of women will do, I refer people to physical therapy all the time mm-hmm. for a variety of like pelvic pain and things like that. And they will give them vaginal dilators, which is are, which are very similar oh. tools that people can use to help with Kegels and things like that. So, yeah. I think they're, think they're I thought good. that was really good. So you're saying um, while they're maybe gimmicky, there's no harm in them and they actually do have some benefit. Yeah, I think benefits. they have some benefit. Yeah. And I'll, the thing is, they're they're not gimmicky for everyone. Like somebody feels that they work really Facts. well for this particular condition or this whatever they want to do. And so if that works for them, I don't think there's really any harm in it. So I love I that. Go for that it. was good. That was a good answer. Okay. Uh, next thing on the topic is V steams and vaginal cleanse. There were a lot of questions. These were all of your submitted questions. Not all of them because I've guessed throughout the week, but um, how to properly cleanse the vagina. I've heard 
um, that the vagina is self cleansing and using too many fragrant products and that mm-hmm. kind of thing can cause um, infections. Yep. So let's talk so, about all that. And can I ask? Yes. Yeah, I'm over here. I'm trying to be the voice of y'all. Um, I also want to ask you about yeast infections. Uh-huh. I don't know if that's related, but I have a hard time. Bladder infection, child, I got it because I get them all the time. But yeast infection, what is it? But answer this one for and we can go to that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of cleaning the vagina, we don't really have to do anything to clean the vagina. Okay. It's not really quite like a self-cleaning oven, but then it kind of is. Okay. Um, the the cells of the vagina slough off and will come out like as discharge. It it just cu- kind of does its own thing and cleans itself. We don't have to use any soaps internally. Um, now you could potentially, if you want, use a mild soap externally. So that's where the anatomy is important. Mm. Like just like you wash your skin on the outside, but we're not like putting soap in our mouth, right? Oh, that was good. I'm glad it was good. <laughs> Learn uh, us today, Dr. <laughs> King. Okay. But you know, okay, right? So l- let's use that example. We wash our face and have this whole beautification routine, mm-hmm. but we don't like, I mean, outside of brushing our teeth, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we're not putting like actual soap in our mouth. So we don't have to put soap into the vagina. In fact, that can potentially disrupt the pH balance and that was a question have too. people lead, you know, be, have them. Um, develop different types of infections Mm -hmm. um same thing so a lot of women will like douche with like baking soda and water um and a variety of things a douche is basically putting a solution into the vagina to clean it out Mm -hmm. baking soda is basic or alkaline Uh about to do a little yes i'm here for a little science little science um the vagina is normally acidic okay so it being an acidic environment helps to keep bacteria at bay Oh. Right. So now if you go and you make it alkaline, ah, then the bacteria are like flipping the balance. Yes, we're here for this. And then you people get infections. So sometimes people will say like, I want you to yes. go back. I want you to say that, that one more again? time. <laughs> yes. Go lead right up to the dance. I want you to say again, because I want to make sure people heard okay. this because I thought that was so good. So there's a pH scale uh-huh. on one side is ba- uh, uh, basic, basic and, and the acidic. other side is acidic mm-hmm. and the other side is alkaline. Well, Alkaline and basic are the same. Okay. Essentially. Tell us the whole thing. Um, and then there's neutral, neutral. which is water is yep. neutral. And then um, acidic. Oh, it's acidic so al- and alkaline. Mm-hmm. Okay. Acidic and alkaline. Okay. And so the vagina is normally on this scale. Is acidic. Okay. So, so it's, it's usually like less than 4, 4.5 pH. Okay. Like a pH balance. Okay. And so when we're adding these products... We're moving it from over here, which keeps a healthy yes. back those bacteria away. Yep. We're moving it from neutral into this side. Yep, and that's into where those big line space and and the, it just creates an environment that make an infection more prone to happen. Um, and so you don't want to do that. And, and then what happens sometimes is people will get an infection and they're like, "Oh, well, now I need to douche." Right. Well, that, and it just it creates literally a vicious cycle where. This is education. When I tell you, I almost want you to like do the pH scale on okay. here because it might not be perfect. No, <laughs> I think that's okay. I, just the idea that yes, it's, like, yes, okay, yes, yes. Uh, so okay. we'll say I'm just going to do. Acidic. I'm going to tell you why. When you understand mm-hmm. what's happening, it is so much easier to make better decisions. Absolutely. Well, and that's the thing. I'm, I'm just, I'm a huge proponent of education so that, that person can be, be empowered. Like, yes. And then if you make great decisions from there on out, like you won't come back with issues and ailments, you know. Um, so this basically a scale, and then there's like we'll just say N for neutral in the middle. Okay. So the vagina is usually acidic, like around like 4.5, a pH of 4.5 or less. Um, and then as as things happen, that increase the um, alkalinity of the vagina that can make infections more prone to happen. So another big thing, I know there were a lot of questions um, about having like odor after intercourse Mm -hmm. and things like that. So guess what? Semen is alkaline. Look at that. Right? So now you have... (laughs) Our men are (laughs) giving us infections! (laughs) Well, not necessarily, but... Necessarily! Listen, listen. So blood is also Mm. generally more alkaline. So guess what? Women have periods. So a lot of women will be like, I get infections every time I have my period. Our bodies are really amazing, but they're very like complex and intricate. Complex was a good word. Yeah. I meant that when I said confusion. (laughs) 
<laughs> but it's like, you know, so a lot of women will come and say, I always get, I always get bacterial vaginosis, like around time of my Tell period. What that is. So bacterial vaginosis is um, an infection with bacteria. So the the vagina generally has good bacteria in it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Those good bacteria are called lactobacilli. Okay. Those similar bacteria are in yogurt and probiotics. This so is that's why, why we have. Say right, it, I it, know it's just such a special moment. Um, but so that's why when, um, and I know we're kind of jumping around a little. We're gonna bring it all together. Okay. But that's why when women, um, someone will have recurrent yeast infections. Mm-hmm. Um, because there is a, a shift in the pH balance. And so that's why if women take a probiotic or like eat a yogurt a day, you increase the lactobacilli, or that, that's the goal, you increase the lactobacilli, the, good, the but, good bacteria, which basically keeps yeast and bacterial vaginosis away. Um, but again, so if, if, so that's one thing about yeast. In terms of specifically bacterial vaginosis, a lot of women will notice that they get it after intercourse, mm-hmm. um, with their periods, and that's because the pH of the vagina has been increased, either with blood or semen, and um, it, it can make them more prone to infection. Now, not everybody gets sure, this sure, afterwards, sure. but it can potentially make them more prone to infection. And those like little bad bacteria are like, are like oh yes, this is the environment that we love to live in. We and flourish They, they come out. on and have a party. And then the patients come to me, not so happy. I think that that was such good information. Um, and it arms us with, again, the knowledge yes. to understand what's happening yes. in our body. And Absolutely. you go so much further when you know. <laughs> you do. You really do. And you can say, oh, this probably happened because of this. Or, you know, people will come with recurrent infections. Um, but then we can figure out ways to help them so that they're not having recurrences. But people don't often realize, they're like, what, what is this? Why does this keep coming back? I don't understand. And then you come and talk and you break it down and you're like going through all like, oh, you had a you had BV in January, then you had it in March, and then you had it in August. And it's like, okay. And, you know, and they start giving a little bit more around each episode and you, you just are able to give a little bit of clarity there. Got you. So what are things that we can do? Um, to keep our pH balance in check. Yeah. Like, especially after sex. That's, mm-hmm. I know that's a big one. I think that was actually like one of my questions. Another question, and I think this still relates to pH, is um, uh, women were talking about smells mm-hmm. that happen specifically like after sex and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And then, okay, just give us some things on pH balance. So sometimes in terms of odors after odors. intercourse, it can just be... Because you've mixed a alkaline mm-hmm. fluid with an acidic environment, um, and so it doesn't always okay. mean <laughs> it okay. doesn't always mean that there's an infection. I mean, generally, if it's not an infection, it's probably going to go away fairly quickly versus lingering for days on end. Okay. Um, one thing that people can do if they're like really concerned, um, they can use condoms because then the semen does not come into contact with the acidic environment. Okay. Um, don't douche. That's another thing because, again, you're going to keep disrupting the normal pH balance. Um, staying hydrated is always good. You know, it just creates, it promotes a good environment for your body I'm going to tell you something. In general. I always feel like I am more prone to infections if I've been on my first leaf and like <laughs> drinking a whole bunch of alcohol because it's a dehydrator. Right. Yep. And so staying hydrated in general. Um, and then, you know, if you're concerned, go in and see see your doctor. Like if something's not, you know, if it goes away in like 30 minutes, probably not a big deal. But if you're having recurrent infections, um, going to get checked out so you can find out what's going on and why it's happening. Oh, my gosh. Dr. <laughs> King. <laughs> <laughs> this is so ask away freaking good did you want to add anything else did we cover everything with the ph i think that we question the, we did the basics yeah okay. i mean i think you know i think we covered like the basics with that for sure okay yeah. i want to make sure because you're right because i'll take you way over here yeah folks be but talking that, about me yeah, but i'm so excited no that's good that's good People need the education. I agree. I'm here for it. And um, I just think that the whole pH thing, I think you ended up covering so many things yeah. because you don't realize they're all tied yes. to. Yes, they're all, they're all tied in. They're all tied in. 
and they can be helped. Oh, another thing really quickly Mm -hmm. is um, you asked earlier about yeast infections. And, you know, we talked about different ways that can happen. But another thing that can happen is if women are on antibiotics, Mm. um, this goes back to the bacteria. Antibiotics don't select. They're not like, we're only going to kill the bad bacteria, but the good bacteria, you can live. So generally, if, say, somebody has a dental infection and they get put on amoxicillin or whatever Mm -hmm. antibiotic, that's going to, it's not going to just help there not be an infection at the dental site. It's going to go systemically. So all the good bacteria in the vagina are like, we're dead goodbye and then the good bacteria are like oh there's room for us to party and the yeast is like yes there's room for us to party so a lot of women will get yeast infections after um antibiotic use for that reason and they'll be like this is classic i know exactly what i have every time i take antibiotics but it's because the good bacteria have been eradicated and killed off and the yeast has come out to play I want to ask you um, the different, what is a yeast infection? But before we do that, child, my brain need a break. (laughs) (laughs) So I want to tell you about my favorite company, as you guys know, maybe you don't know, if you're new here, maybe you don't know, but Third Love is absolutely hands down my favorite bra that I wear and use quite often and advocate for because they are literally my favorite. And if you are in my book club booze, you know that I am doing a massive giveaway, um, uh, you you want to join for this. I'm going to announce it probably the day this comes out. I'm going to announce the uh, requirements for it. But I am also giving away a third love bra because I want you to experience the joy that is a third love bra. They are comfortable. They are comfortable they are comfortable because the only real thing you need in a good bra is comfortability like that's it uh and they offer like 80 plus sizes including their signature half sizes they are just freaking amazing i wear their bras i think i have one on right now at the end of the day i am not rushing to take my bra off and that means something um plus you get to skip the trip to the 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 uh to the stores and get the size and all that they have a quiz that you take you take it on there they give you like their recommended size then they'll also send you their sister size you get to decide which one fits better and then send the other one back child risk free they'll wear it wash it send it to women in need child it, they cover all the things check 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 um, every customer, did I say you have 60 days to wear it, wash it, and put it to the test? I think I did. Okay. Uh, that's 60 days, donated to need, all of the things. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they're offering my listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash love hour now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash love hour for 15% off off go there today um so before we took a break you were talking you mentioned yeast yeast infections Mm -hmm. or yeast and um i think it might be important to child at least for me for people people me i am people uh to explain the difference between or not even the difference because maybe they're not related at all but what is a yeast infection so A yeast infection is essentially a fungal infection. Mm. Yeast is a fungus. Um, There's there are different types of fungi, and that's the plural form. Yes. (laughs) Um, If you think of like ringworm Mm. or something like that, it's a fungus. It's a fungal infection. Got you. And they thrive in dark, warm. Mm. Moist places. The vagina. The vagina. <laughs> the, the inside one. Bre- the inside one. It's <laughs> the perfect breeding ground for yeast in the perfect storm of circumstances. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you don't have a healthy pH balance, you may be more prone to yeast infections. Um, but it's 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 literally just a, just a fungus because it causes, you know, so many problems and discomforts for people but it's 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 a fungal infection what are the classic telltale signs of a yeast infection classic telltale signs itching Mm. clumpy discharge those are probably the two most common for yeast infection shout i was trying to figure out i'm like have i been having yeast infections and i've been thinking they were bladder infections but oh yeah yeah (laughs) well people will come in and say i think i have a bladder infection it Again, they just don't know where their parts are. Mm-hmm. And when you start asking, they're like, well, it's kind of like hurts like down in there. And I'm like, well, it's nowhere near your bladder. But OK, <laughs> tell me more, you know. Um, but yeah, telltale signs. 
itching and like clumpy, usually like clumpy white or like a yellow mm. discharge. Classic. Like people will say that and I'm like, okay, you probably have yeast. Yeah. Got you. Anything else we wanted to add? Can I ask? Yes. How do you get rid of one? Ooh, so, good follow up question. Yes. <laughs> so generally, um, antibiotics. Actually, let me reverse that. Antifungals, because antifungals are different from antibiotics. Um, But usually an antifungal cream, like you'll see over-the-counter Monistat or something like that. I'm not sure if I was supposed to say that. No, you can. Go ahead. Um, But like any over-the-counter like antifungal cream or your doctor may prescribe an antifungal pill that you can take. And then going forward, like I said, some people, if they're like really prone to getting them, Um, I may say, okay, hey, take a probiotic, eat some yogurt every day, really like evaluate what you're eating in general. Like if you're like, if you're putting crap in your body and just eating all kinds of processed foods, drinking all kinds of pop, like your, your body is not really in a healthy environment that's like trying to keep, you know, these little infections and stuff away. Um, Don't douche to get rid of it. And those are really the, the big, the big things that I would say in terms of how to get rid of it. But usually you need an antifungal of some sort. For the most part, some women, if they have recurrent infections and say they get they get them like once a month, they can actually uh, be prescribed by their doctor boric acid suppositories. Um, I know that sounds really. What is that? Yeah, you're like, hold up. It sounded harsh, didn't it? I know. (laughs) Right. You're like, I had a friend ask me. She was like. Can you can can you use boric acid yeah. in the vagina? That is isn't that laundry detergent? Yeah. I was like, well, that's borax. Yeah. I, don't, <laughs> I don't think those two are the same. But we talked about acidic and alkaline. Come on, so take us you, to chemistry. Yes, if you put in an acid suppository, boric acid, and it's not like gonna like destroy your vagina. It's not gonna like start crumbling apart. I got what it's gonna do. Yeah. Keep going, keep going. And so it's gonna acidify the vagina to help keep these infections at bay. So we don't. that's not like first line treatment. Um, it's usually when people have recurrences. Like if somebody has one yeast infection a year, they usually get cream or a pill and call Done. it a day. Yeah. That was so good. I knew you where you were going because I yes. was like, the vagina is supposed to be yes. acidic. So I mean, now do not go home and start putting acidic things in your vagina. Mm, teach us. So, because somebody's gonna be like, "Well, Dr. King said the vagina was acidic." Listen, so if I just you put just this took us to med here, school in sixty minutes. <laughs> if I just if I just put this in here, and then you're gonna be coming to me with like a contact dermatitis and itching and irritated because you didn't put something there that wasn't supposed to go there. So don't. Have don't create weird home things like out of acids at home. Don't do that. That's not a good idea. <laughs> Please, this I beg of you. Just for don't inter- do information that. and entertainment purposes, yes. we are not educating you to go be a doctor. <laughs> I am not examining you by phone. Don't send us pictures do to not. find out why the cream that you facts. made. Don't Please don't send do them not. to her DM. She does not want to see your vulva. At all, <laughs> the, the Volvo or the don't open it. Either. <laughs> They're like, can you please? I heard you on the podcast with Dr. King. Could you please look at this and pass this along to her? Do don't well. do that. Nope. I love this. I'm so freaking excited and just like I feel really armed with really great information. Yes. I want to go back to the vaginal cleanse because I don't know. I don't remember if we talked about if we like put a button on that as far as like the proper way to cleanse. Did we? <gasps> Not, I don't think we quite did, but you don't have to do really a whole lot. Cleaning externally is fine okay. um, in terms of the vulva, the lips, the mons. Um, you could you know, do a very gentle soap or just water, um, but don't put any, I wouldn't really put soap in the vagina. Again, you can alter, potentially alter the, the pH. They have lots of different like hygiene washes and things like that. Um, you, don't, you don't really need to use those things. Um, Like I said, the vagina pretty much cleans itself. I love that. Okay, um, let me see what else I want. I want to stay on the vagina. We talked about the smells. Mm -hmm. Uh, What about, oh, this is the last one. It's a myth. The vagina (gasps) loses its elasticity with every sexual partner. True, false myth. (laughs) Myth. Tell us why. So th- this is kind of a multifaceted answer. Um, 
the va- the vagina is a very elastic organ. Okay. Right? We learn that with yes. the potential space. Yes. Because it stretches. Yes, in. and it comes back. It doesn't just expand and then like stay stiff mm-hmm. and then expand again and then stay there. Women have babies vaginally all of the time. These babies are three, four, five, depending on how early they are, six, seven, eight, nine, ten pounds. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of baby coming out of a very small potential space. Mm -hmm. And then it goes back. Even when women have babies, like it's it's not like it remains the size of like the baby's head for like so true days and weeks. So it will basically, you know, after the baby comes out, kind of contract back down. Um, But it doesn't just stay expanded. Mm -hmm. It is very elastic. The second part of that is when women have multiple babies, sometimes the pelvic floor musculature can become lax. So there's muscles in your pelvic floor. We talked about Kegel exercises. The ligaments, the pelvic floor muscles can definitely become more lax. And so there can be laxity, if you will, in the vaginal space. Um, But it's usually not just like stretching out infinitely you know, across the ends of the earth. (laughs) I think that I just kind of got a revelation and maybe it'll help and you can tell me if I'm on the right track. A lot of times we hear the vagina and the elasticity and we think of a rubber band. Mm -hmm. And so I almost think that there's a problem with the rubber band analogy and follow me. When you think of a rubber band, number one, even in its resting position, it it can open. Right. Okay. The vagina doesn't do that. In its resting position, it's it's kind of close yes. it's com- Flat. or co- yeah, collapsed compressed. yeah, yeah. Collapsed. okay um but in a resting position with the rubber band like it can still be open mm-hmm. okay then once the rubber band expands or and it starts to lose its elasticity mm-hmm. um it doesn't even really go like it can be stretched never to return right right and i don't think you're saying that the vagina will do that yeah it's it's not never to return but there are certainly women who have laxity in the pelvic floor, in the vagina, usually as women, if they've had multiple babies or even just one, um, and as they age, those muscle muscles and ligaments become relaxed. So women will ha- will come in with like their bladder falling down, mm. um, which is you know just kind of a layman's term of um, like bladder prolapse, mm-hmm. or with their uterus and cervix no longer really well supported in their pelvis. It's mm-hmm. kind of like coming, like they can push when we're doing an exam and the uterus comes down. Mm. So things can become a little bit more um, lax. But, you know, the other thing is we also don't like measure the vagina. Like we don't measure someone's vagina when they're 20 and then compare it to when they're like right. 50 to say, okay, well, it was, you know, three centimeters wide now and now it's five centimeters mm-hmm. wide. Um, but there can absolutely be laxity there. But laxity meaning um, t- the tightness. Yeah, like more just kind of, yeah. Not so much like it grew. No. Yeah, it's not like it's just permanently expanded forever. I think no. that was good. Did that make sense? Yeah, I think it helped too. Because I think a lot of times, um, and we were talking about this off camera, we think that, the, we, you know, we hear, ooh, her vagina was tight. Ooh, she was tight. She was tight. And so if you feel like you've had, or if you've internalized the idea that you need to be tight and mm-hmm. you've had multiple partners and maybe you feel like it's not, it can breed a lot of like shame right. in your like sexuality. Mm-hmm. Say it. Say well, I was going to say, say, the other thing is, okay, really What's the difference between having multiple partners or one partner that you've had sex with multiple times? I mean, what's the difference? Do you know what I mean? Yes. So th- that's a total like. <laughs> Why haven't we thought about this before? I don't know. People? I think about it. I mean, it's it's true. Like, but again, like you said, there's lots of shame and stigma, often directed at women. And so, of course, it's like, well, if you have sex with multiple people, things are going to be different mm-hmm. and stretched out. Mm-hmm. Well, if you have sex with 10 people once, that's 10 times. But you have sex with one person 10 times, what's the difference? I mean, there are differences. Right, right, but right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I get it. I mean, in terms of what's happening to the vaginal organ itself mm-hmm. is not really much different. So that was a read to all of us ignorant folks that didn't make the connection. <laughs> Just mic drop. Oh, man, that was really good. So, I mean, that's probably what I would say mostly to that is that it's not really, it's just, yeah, that's what I would say. It it is, some, it sounds like it was a myth that was created to to Mm. shame us. Mm -hmm. Well. So is the hymen too. I've heard that too. Oh, God. That that's a whole, but really behind it is a lot of of, um, shame, uh, shame. 
shame for women's sexuality, like to control women's sexuality is probably right. a better way and to so say it. And so generally, like, so what you're speaking of is people feel that if the, oh, my picture's gone, but the opening of the vagina, there's a little like kind of ring of tissue. It's called the hymen. Mm-hmm. And in many cultural instances, people believe that if the hymen is intact, right. meaning there's no separations or tears, mm-hmm. that that person is a virgin. a virgin. And that if it is not intact, that means that that person has been sexually active, mm-hmm. which both can be completely not True. So they're not you, related to. Yes, each other. there there are women who've never been sexually right. active and whose hymens are not intact for whatever reason. And there are people who have been sexually active whose hymens remain intact. And so previously there they you didn't know that. I didn't know that it remained. I knew that like you could it could not be intact mm-hmm. before, but I didn't know that it remained intact. Yeah, it Even it could. It. Yeah, it can. It doesn't necessarily have to tear. There are some societies where on someone's wedding night, they are using a sheet to see if there is any bleeding mm. with intercourse, because if there's bleeding, then that means that the, she was a virgin. And yes, it was broken. And, that the, and that it was broken or torn or whatever. And I don't know if that's still practice, but I've you know I've heard that. Um, I've even in some heard cultures. in some cultures they use it for rape as a determination to tell if um, a sexual like uh, rape happened is by checking the hymen. And so women have been told um, that like they're lying, right? Basically, Which is crazy, right? And so being armed again, this is just so much knowledge mm-hmm. and recognizing that they're not maybe they're they're can't they can be related, but they don't always have to have like a one to one correlation. It's like not causality. Sexually active, right? Causality was a great word. Yeah, it's 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 quite fascinating. There are people that will still do exams Mm -hmm. like a mom will bring her young daughter in which we absolutely should not do there are no exams that i can determine outside of me asking your child a question and them either being truthful or not with what they're doing and behave how their behavior is um that can determine if that child has been sexually active and then you have to think about if you have a young teenager and they've never been sexually active and now you're asking them to expose themselves. That's traumatizing. Like, traumatizing. You want me to do this exam and oh my God, what are you doing and what are you looking at and why and where? Not that there should be any shame in their bodies, but the message behind it is, right, I agree. is, is what's wrong. So, you know, every once in a while I'll have parents, um, and my staff will come and say, this mom wants to um, just get her daughter checked. And I'm like, Checked for what? What are we checking for? I'm like, <laughs> does she have, a, she have a problem? And Pacific. <laughs> yeah, like, is there a problem? Or does she have issues with her periods? W- what are we checking for? No, we're not checking for anything along those lines. So unless she's having issues with her periods or what have you, we're not, that, that's not what we're doing. You know, so, so yeah. Child. I said Pacific for y'all in the comments, <laughs> but it was intentional. It was a joke. You're uh, like, I do know my I grammar. Do know that it is specific. Um, but specifically, uh, <laughs> this has been phenomenal. Yay. I think we all have learned something. I have been armed and I most definitely learned something. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, for joining me today, educating us, schooling us and giving us med school for dummies. Child. <laughs> I learned so much. Do you want to give any like last th- I know you talked about advocating that something like let's like a uh, cause that's near and dear to your heart. Anything else you want to add? And then of course, tell people where to find you because child. not only is she a doctor, but she is fierce and fabulous she gives serves uh outfits of the day she serves hair she serves nails she serves these cute yes. shoes that stopped me dead in my tracks while we were talking earlier i was talking and was like hold on a second <laughs> <laughs> Would you just walk in here with those shoes on? Yes, They're cute. I do. Um, so I love that you're like, you know, you're about your business and you're doing it fierce and fabulous. So please tell the people again, any last words and where they can find you. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I, I've said it a few times um, as we've been talking, but education is empowerment. So the more education you can know, the more information you can gather, um, the better your life in general will be, but, but especially about your health. Um, find out what's going on with your body. Be in touch with your body. Listen to your body. Don't ignore signs and mm-hmm. signals. You know, I have people all the time that come in and they're like really, really, really worried and everything's fine. And then every now and then you have people come in 
and everything's not fine mm. and they haven't been to the doctor in 10 years um, and if only they had come and you know you do the shoulda coulda wouldas so just empower yourself the more you're educated the more empowered you are the less fear you remove the fear That's you so remove true. the stigma you're not scared um, you just say hey this is what I'm facing let me go and figure it out let me fix it let me see what's going on so that would be the, that would probably be my biggest takeaway um, you can find me on Instagram at Dr. Kiara King and on my blog at drkiaraking.com. Oh, I'm so excited. Um, again, I will say thank you a gazillion times. We were on the phone like, thank you, no, thank you, no, thank you. I said thank you first, <laughs> so my thank you is one of this. We did, I'm so, so grateful for you um, joining us today and for just sharing your knowledge and schooling us. And I hope that you, the audience, have learned something. I know that I have learned something on today yes. so thank you so very much um again join thank you to well before i even say that thank you to our sponsors as you know the podcast is ad supported um free to you but ad supported so when you support our sponsors you are also supporting the show and by supporting our sponsors you allow me to have fabulous guests because she has a flip a plane ride that needs to be brought into lax for her to get here so when you support our sponsors it allows me to have fabulous guests on for um, for you all to listen to and learn from. So thank you to First Leaf. Thank you to Ship Station, Attitude, and Third Love. I also want to tell you about the Love Hour Conference. It is coming July 2020. All of my speakers have been released with the exception of one couple that just confirmed like two days ago. I will get um, that out to you here soon. And I also want to tell you about Plus One. It is event um, curated date night service that Kevin and I are launching. The first one is December 8th in Charlotte. Information will be in the description box and join my book club. We are women who love to be empowered with knowledge and better ourselves. It is fun. It is a community of women who support each other and it's my favorite thing again the link to that will be in the description box below those are all of my announcements again thank you to our guest dr king thank you for joining me until the next time bye